When our best fur friends leave our world, many of us are left wanting one last scritch, one last hug, one last walk together. One Last Network is a space for pet guardians to honor their pets in their senior years and to cope with the days leading up to and after their passing. Here's your host, Angela Schneider, founder of One Last Network and Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington. Hey, welcome back to One Last Network. Last week I interviewed professional pet photographer Kylie Doyle of Kylie Doyle Photography in Sacramento, California. Kylie's journey in pet photography has shifted in the last several years. Since adopting an emotional Dutch Shepherd named Omega, she has realized pet parents with reactive dogs may not feel confident in exposing their best fur friends to a portrait session. She wants to change that and ensure pet parents in Northern California not only have the opportunity, but also the resources to learn how to manage their little basket cases. Kylie found a wonderful resource in Allison Dack of Dack Pack Dog Training, which Allison founded in June 2016, after nearly a decade of working in wildlife rehabilitation and dog training facilities around the United States. Allison and her team are committed to helping owners create practical, actionable solutions to problematic behaviors using the latest science on animal behavior, a deep understanding of their clients' lifestyles and needs, and an empathetic approach. I'm turning the mic over to Kylie this week so she can put Allison on the hot seat about working with reactive dogs, especially as they age. Have a listen. You're sure to pick up a few things about working with your own sweet babe. I'm meeting today with Allison Dack, the founder of Dack Pack Dog Training, serving pet parents in the greater Sacramento area. Allison and her team specialize in helping pet parents find practical, actionable solutions to problematic behaviors through fear-free and empathetic training approaches. Today, Allison will be sharing her work with reactive dogs with us, and we'll get a little bit into how reactivity can change in our fur babies as they age. Welcome to the podcast, Allison. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. So for those of you who have listened to uh, my previous episode where I talked a little bit about my work in photographing reactive dogs um, and my own fur baby Omega, um, Allison is actually the trainer who helped us to get through those early struggles with him and learn how to manage that reactivity. So I'm really excited for her to be able to share some of her expertise with everyone. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started. So um, I've been training animals for about 15 years now. I actually started uh, working as like a veterinarian assistant at uh, like a dog store that my, or like a pet store that my dad had when I was really, when I was really young. And then very quickly after that, I uh, did some work with um, wildlife in the greater Sacramento area. Um, and then ended up doing a little bit of work with exotics um, and rehab in a couple different states. And then, you know, I did some work with some various dog training companies and just felt like they like I was never able to fully like hit the mark and being able to like help people. So I ended up starting backpack dog training, kind of focusing on behavior. So really focusing on dogs that are experiencing fear, anxiety, aggression, or atypical behaviors. And I uh, started that in uh, June of 2016. And then I uh, kind of brought on a few of my colleagues that I had been working with for years um, to be able to better service everybody. And so now we kind of work uh, really collaboratively on cases and react uh, like reactive dogs or that, you know, kind of barking, lunging, especially like on leash, you know, that and like stranger danger dogs are probably our most common cases that we see a lot of. So what led you to want to specialize in those types of dogs? You know, I think uh, growing up, like I just always had a draw towards 
um, animals and behavior. You know, my dad was the assistant manager of the SPCA growing up. My mom actually went to school with a degree in like psychology and biology, like focusing on doing what I do now, but with birds. And she ended up running a pet store. And so I just kind of like grew up with, I mean, dozens and dozens of dozens of animals in my house from toucans to dogs, to seahorses, turtles. Like we had a whole like uh, foster animal room and I just kind of like feel like every step in life, even if I try to step away from animals, at one point I was did EMT work and stuff like that. And I always just got drawn back toward animals. I feel like there's just a connection there. You don't change the world by, the average person doesn't change the world by doing these like large heroic things. It's just like helping to spread kindness in like day-to-day -day life and I feel like I feel like I love what I do and I feel like I'm able to make such a big impact in people's lives and animals life and lives and it's just I don't know like there's just nothing there's nothing as rewarding as like what I do now <laughs> that I could think of. <laughs> I love that. So I know that you mentioned um, that you work a lot with reactive dogs and uh, like stranger danger. Um, are there any specific types of dogs that you really enjoy working with more than others or ones that you feel like need the help more than others? Yeah, you know, I think the more complicated the case, the more I love it. I really enjoy, you know, like we work really closely with like uh, UC Davis and like their animal behavior department and like their veterinarian behaviorist team over there and they're fantastic. And we get a lot of these cases where it's like, you know, a lot of the cases we work with have multiple diagnoses, have really complicated behaviors or elements of the case are really complicated. It's just awful. I feel like when you have a dog that has these emotional issues, because when you look at a lot of dogs that even are reactive um, or that we would label reactive, it's not a lack of obedience, it's an emotional response. And, you know, it's so, it's so hard to like look at that and see, you know, it's so easy to feel on an island when you're the pet parent, but mm -hmm. there's so many going through it but it's it's this weird it's it's so hard because it's like you get this dog that's so scared or anxious or frustrated with all of these complicated associations just kind of like living on this you know in this like high arousal high stress state and you know you have people who are feeling overwhelmed they may be feeling guilty embarrassed scared you know it's just it's a lot it's so hard to be in that place. And I've been in that place with some of my own animals in the past. And it's such a difficult place. Like sometimes we all just need like a hand up out for the animal and the human. We just need a hand out of the water. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's really rewarding being able to walk in and help things line up. And not every case pans out. There's a lot of things that are outside of my control or even owner's controls. But, you know, there's a lot of cases that we can make such a, like, such a world-changing difference. And it may only be the world of that one dog or the world of that one person who owns that dog, but those worlds still matter. And it's those cases where it's like a lot of, you know, where it's like other professionals referring it to me, where they're just there's not a lot of hope, you know, um, and mm -hmm. just like a lot to like behaviorally tear apart um, where, you know, uh, you may have like resource guarding issues. You may have sound sensitivity, sound aversion uh, issue to strangers. So then you have like all these different pieces to the puzzle that kind of all have to be triaged and processed through. And those are, those are the cases that I find the most rewarding. And I think it's so important, the distinction that you make, that with these types of dogs, it's not usually an obedience issue. It's more of an emotional problem, or they're very anxious, they're nervous, they're scared. Because I think with my own dog, Omega, that was when we first came to you, that was where we were struggling. Because for us, it was this dog, it, he's not even capable of listening to any 
anything that we're telling him because he's so overwhelmed by his emotions. And I think the people that are going through this with their dogs really have to come to understand that. Yeah. And I, and I think going back to kind of like today's topic of reactivity, I think sometimes when we look at reactivity, it's a reactive dog. It's not a diagnosis we would see necessarily like from a veterinarian behaviorist. It's a label or a construct that we give to describe like behaviors that we can see. And a lot of times it's, you know, a dog that's barking or lunging mm -hmm. and um, it can be a really helpful medium for us to communicate together quickly. But sometimes I feel like when we you say like reactivity, we can accidentally create or lock ourselves into like a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. where it's like the dog's reactive, it's not aggressive, it's reactive, it's not fearful. Sometimes we can get so locked into the reactive label that I feel like sometimes we can miss what's behind it. You know, okay, the dog's yeah. reactive, but why? You know, is the dog scared of people? Does the dog experience fear-based aggressive behaviors towards strangers? Or is it super excitable about other dogs and is experiencing barrier frustration because it can't get to that dog? Reactivity is great to communicate to each other, but I think sometimes we can get stuck. I'll see very frequently with especially like human-directed type behaviors like that, where it's um, the dog's uh, the dog's reactive, it's not aggressive. And it's like, oh, okay, well, the dog is barking and lunging and air snapping. And yeah, maybe hasn't bitten anybody yet, but that potential's there. It's an animal with a mouth and teeth. That potential to bite is there. Those feelings are there. And so I think it's great, but I think sometimes we can get stuck in those labels a little bit and get lost from the whole picture. Yeah, and that's an interesting point because I think even with my pet photography clients, because I do always ask beforehand, especially in that I do work with plenty of dogs who may have some sort of reactivity or anxiousness, but we do tend to use that broader reactive term. It is very important that even with my work that I kind of try to drill down into what does reactive mean to you? Because I, I agree, I think we kind of label it as this broader term so that we can kind of understand, hey, there's something that's maybe unique with this dog that could be aggression, could be not aggression. Um, but I think getting kind of drilling down into what does that actually mean? Is that anxiety? Is it nervousness? Is it fear? It's definitely important. So let's talk a little bit more about the types of training that you offer. I know that you are fear-free certified, um, so let's talk a little bit about that and how the types of training methods that you use can really be helpful with these types of dogs. Yeah, so um, uh, being certified fear-free is through Fear Free Pet, and you can actually find not only dog trainers who are certified, but veterinarians, whole veterinarian clinics, or groomers. And I believe they have a pet sitter certification now, um, or maybe thinking about a different program. That program in itself is for at least the dog trainer side, um, you have to have certain credentials ahead of time and kind of like take a little like mini test to like qualify into it. And then it's this like modular program with all these quizzes and stuff. That is quite a bit of time. And it's focused on handling and training techniques that help to reduce fear um, and anxiety in animals and especially around like cooperative care or like um, handling and in veterinarian clinics. Um, and then, you know, that, that kind of translates to our training approach in general. So for background, I am a crossover trainer. I have used a lot of different techniques over my years of training animals from using shock collars and prong collars. And I think this topic itself could probably be several podcasts. It's a, <laughs> definitely a very, very passionate and heated topic within the professional community. It's called, it's like the great divide, but, uh, you know, just focusing on my own journey and my own perspective, I, as I learned more, and especially as I grew my own education, because what's hard about dog training and what a lot of people 
I don't think realize is that dog training in the United States more or less is pretty unregulated. Um, we can use any terms we want. We can have any limited experience, you know, it even gets questionable into past experiences with animals and stuff like that. And like, it's just, it is unregulated. Like you can do and say and tell people whatever you want with more or less no repercussions, you know, unless you have credentials like mine, then they can get revoked and stuff. But uh, it's a little bit like the Wild West. So you get a lot of different variations. And when I, in the beginning of my career, I was very much like learned on, like learned by mentors, learned by just doing it myself without really a whole lot of education because I didn't have to have an education. And I think as I've learned more about the science and the how and the why and physiology and evolution of dogs and getting into all of that stuff, I've really gravitated towards fear-free and like force-free training. And I've found personally, like if I look back over my career, I feel like the more force I've had to use with an animal, the less skills I had in that moment, Mm -hmm. the less tools in my toolbox I had in that moment to fall back on because I think it's the game of it's not that punishment doesn't work it's not that those things don't work but they come at a risk they do come at a risk from either emotional or physically there are risks and when there's ways that we can get the same results without having to risk fear or anxiety without having to risk emotional confliction without having to risk issues you know for example like uh i think a really common one that i've seen um i can think back to a couple cases uh there was this one client that i worked with in lincoln to to give a specific anecdote they hired me for a dog that you would label as reactive if the dog saw dogs or people on walks lunge bark growl air snap the dog uh happened to be a pit bull um uh, several years old, so like kind of like after full development, and um, I just I'll I'll always remember the um, consultation I had with them as I walked in. The dog was on a prong collar, and when we did kind of the initial assessment where we set up for that stranger protocol and try to add in some behavior modification techniques like counter conditioning and desensitization, where it's like me as the monster equals awesome stuff. <laughs> <laughs> essentially every time I saw that prong of collar tighten the intensity of the dog's behavior would increase mm-hmm. and I had them switch off the prong collar and then it's one thing too like if I have a new client like it's the goal is to transition away from tools but I'm not going to come in and just like knock clients out at the knees right <laughs> if I don't <laughs> a lot of times we're you know, people are hanging on by a thread and maybe, maybe, maybe it's that, maybe it's that collar. And it's like, okay, like I need to give you something else that serves the same function for you (laughs) Mm -hmm. so that I can shift you away. I'm not going to take the one thing that makes you feel mildly comfortable. Um, That's not a good way for people to learn either. And so I'm like, okay, like, let's just try something. And I had them switch to just like a flat buckle collar then we didn't see that same increase of, in intensity, you know, whether that was like more intense behavior, or the dog would also like whip around and try to bite the leash and stuff. And just switching the dog off the prong collar, the dog didn't get as intense, was not redirecting, was much more responsive to the treats and settled down. And if I take a step back and look at like what's happening, even if it's not a dog that's displaying that intense behavior, even if it's just say that like really excitable dog on leash, pulling towards it, pulling and barking towards another dog because they want to play and interact. Well, that dog on leash on that tool, as they go to engage that other dog, that's when the dog's getting, receiving that punishment. So, and I think something that's important for us to remember is what's punishing, what's reinforcing, and what those associations are rubbed off on are at the end of the day up to the learner, up to the dog. How is that dog forming that association? Is it the 
you know, okay, like I see another dog when I'm on leash. Oh man, like it's so frustrating. All I want to do is play. Oh, I'm going to now have like bigger your frustration. Okay, like get more intense as I try to get to that other dog. Ow, ow, like, oh, oh, this is so annoying. This is so frustrating. And so then what can happen over time is that that animal's behavior gets more intense. And that can happen with or without to like punishment-based tools. That just adds like one more piece to that puzzle that can add confliction, that can increase frustration, that can potentially cause some anxiety or intensify the dog's association because punishment's really hard to do like in operant conditioning, looking at using aversives um, like positive punishment or negative reinforcement correctly to teach a behavior requires a lot of skill. It's not as forgiving <laughs> as, as um, positive reinforcement always is. Um, it takes really, really dialed in timing and pre precision and ob observation skills and it's kind of one of those where it's like, if, if you have, if you're good enough to do that correctly, then you're good enough to not need to. <laughs> there are other tools out there without, that don't pose the risk of intensifying those behaviors or the risk of fallout and creating new issues or new associations. Right, very true. So these dogs that you work with that we might label as reactive, just to pivot a little bit, do you ever see increasing or changing reactivity or behavioral issues as they age? I think it's it's common to see dogs that show some maybe smaller signs when they're younger. So um, maybe they, they're the six-month-old puppy that has like a really hard stare and like fixates really hard or is really hypervigilant. Maybe they pull a little bit, maybe they like bark and pull a little, but then they can like redirect or maybe they're not necessarily reactive, but they're really hesitant. You know, maybe they're, uh, they try to avoid people or dogs. Uh, they approach them in a more hesitant manner or the other side of things, maybe they're just super excited and they just try to like pull you down the street to see stuff. Where we see, see these emotional responses starting to form, but if they're in young dogs without a lot of learned history, so they're just smaller behaviors. And then a, a big point where we can see uh, a lot of clients kind of like see these big shifts are around like you know, like one and a half to two and a half, you know, around where like, uh, like um, emotional maturity and like starts to like set in dogs. It's really common to see where the, the dogs have enough learned history now or uh, their brain is kind of developed enough to start forming bigger associations and start kind of Hey, like I, like I'm not. I try to avoid other dogs and people, and that doesn't really work that well. <laughs> and they start being able to put those pieces together, and we can start seeing more intense behaviors around like that age in particular. What about in elderly dogs? Do you ever see it? You know, as they start to slow down, maybe they're a little bit more in pain from arthritis or other illnesses going on. Yeah, you know, and a lot of times, like, once once dogs are, like, older, uh, a lot of times it's not, like, a, I feel like it's less common that I see, like, an elder, like, an elderly dog have, like, a new type of reactive behavior, but maybe it's a little bit more intense, um, and definitely, like, uh, when we look at behavior, you know, there's a lot that goes into behavior, including like physical health and how the animal's feeling. I think really common places where we can see behaviors getting exaggerated from would be like um, osteo issues. So like arthritis, hip dysplasia, even allergies can be a big proponent. Dental problems, you know, uh, GI issues. You know, if you don't feel good, you're, you have a much, it's common to have um, a much shorter fuse. Um, and the same is true with dogs. And when we start getting older, there can be 
more physical things that can be happening that can make them not feel good that can definitely exasperate behaviors. So are there any specific types of signs that you would recommend pet parents look for, um, especially in like older dogs that maybe they're not as obvious with their signs that they might be starting to experience some increased reactivity? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I can definitely give my two cents on it. At the end of the day, I'm not a veterinarian, so definitely partnering with your veterinarian is a big help. But any, like, I think the, the, the number one thing to look for, too, is like a really, like, sudden change of behavior. If your dog for the first 10 years of its life, like, never barked and lunged at leash, on leash, and at 10 years old without, like, anything noticeably really happening or changing, the behavior kind of changes drastically. Um, any like change, drastic change of behavior is important because not only do we get into the things that we mentioned earlier, but we can also get into hormonal like imbalances and thyroid issues and, and things like that that we can't always see. But like any sudden change in the dog's behavior, whether that's more intense behavior or the dog's becoming more lethargic if like the dog starts getting like really stinky breath or like a change in appetite you know maybe they love eating the like maybe they'll still eat their wet food and their treats but they don't really eat the kibble anymore um, when they always have in the past or like mobility issues you know uh, maybe they don't really hop on the bed anymore and they used to love that but you notice they really don't anymore or maybe they don't hop on the sofa anymore or not as frequently, or they don't go up the stairs as much anymore. Maybe their uh, walk is a lot stiffer. You know, maybe they don't really want to play fetch anymore. I think that the biggest thing, animals can mask pain and discomfort re really well. I think one of the best signs is just like a change of behavior and kind of taking a step back and being like, what could affect that? Okay, you know, like this dog used to love to play fetch and like you know, now they just don't anymore, you know, did something bad happen during fetch? Is the dog also not really participating in other physical exercise as much or doesn't seem to be enjoying it as much? If there's vomiting or diarrhea that's starting to occur, even like intermittently, yeah, like any, like any of those, the, the key, the key is, and there's so many different types of behaviors that can exist, but really like a sudden, like a sudden change is just such a key, key thing to like bring up to your veterinarian. Yeah, definitely, definitely watch for those things. Are there any specific resources beyond working with your veterinarian um, that you would recommend for pet parents who might be struggling with reactivity in their dogs? First off, like depending on what's going on, like there are times where looking at behavior medication could potentially be helpful in some dogs. And that's something that your veterinarian may or may not have experience in, you know, and that's where partnering with like a veterinarian behaviorist could be helpful. If we have a dog that has a wide range of triggers, maybe has a really delayed recovery time, you know, has a really intense, really goes into really high arousal levels, a lot of impulsivity, very compulsive. There's things like generalized anxiety or separation anxiety or sound aversion or if it's something where it's like not manageable a dog could, another dog could be within 300 feet of us and there's absolutely nothing that I can do where it's just that intense you know that's always a resource looking for qualified trainers so um, especially trainers that are educated and have experience working with dogs with similar issues to the issues that you're seeing. And that could be looking for dogs that have a certification through the um, CCPDT or um, through the IAABC or are, is a graduate from the Academy of Dog Trainers or the Karen Pryor Academy or the Victoria Stillwell Academy, those could be good places to look to start with. You're still going to have to do some, some weeding a bit, but uh, looking for, for people who have some leg legitimate credentials and 
experience can be really helpful. And especially since the industry is unregulated, looking for people who chose to be regulated Um, Because there's things like if I did and it was ever reported to any of the agencies that I have credentials through, like I would get them revoked (laughs) potentially. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking where there's some level of accountability and then from there, really, really um, take the time to talk to the person that you're looking at hiring, ask them questions, you know, about not only like their prices, but also, you know, like what are the the methods they use? Like, what are, is their comfort level? Are they collaborative with other professionals? Like, are there additional resources they have? And like, make sure that it's someone that you're really comfortable with and you are comfortable in the approach that they use and you feel like they connect with you. I think that's like the biggest thing at the end of the day is a lot of times we think of dog training as like a dog trainer coming out and training the dog, but a lot of it is training the people. So not only do we want someone who's going to be good at training the dog, but you want to find someone who you feel like you can, re- like who you can learn from, you mm-hmm. know, that you feel like they're going to be a good teacher for you. <laughs> and all, all of those places too have a lot of like blogs and like resources on their own websites as well, you know, along with like webinars or smaller self-paced courses. Um, Fear Free Pets has have good resources as well. You know, um, honestly, like if you're in the Sacramento dog area, the um, Sacramento Dog Owners Facebook group run by Kayla Block is really good. We also have um, a private Facebook group that people are welcome to join called the DAC Pack. And in your own community, see if there are trainers that have some more community-based resources, like Facebook groups like that, or if you talk to your shelter, maybe the shelter has some more community-oriented programs that are available. That's awesome. I know, you know, personally, I have definitely used a lot of those local resources. So for anyone else in the Sacramento area, I would say for sure, check some of those Facebook groups out. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to share? Oh man, you know, like I, <laughs> I could talk forever about dogs. Um, Couldn't we know. all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like there's so many different paths that I could go down. I mean, if anyone, if anyone needs any help, we offer like services in the greater Sacramento area and online um, or honestly, like if people are looking for a local dog trainer in the area, but they're having a hard time, feel free to reach out. You know, I'm always happy to help connect people with trainers. Uh, they're especially like, there's such a big network within our own internal communities to really try to refer out to other individuals. Yeah, so what's the best way for people to reach out to you or get more information on working with you? Yeah, you know, if you go to our website, dacpack.com, so D-A-A-C-K-P-A-C-K, we have our, uh, we offer like a free um, 15-minute virtual screening for people, um, and you can sign up for that directly on the website. And uh, then we also have our phone number, 916 uh, two eight seven three two three zero. We have our Facebook page and our Instagram account too that we post information on, and we're hoping to here shortly start actually offering group reactivity classes um, in the greater Sacramento area that will be available um, to the public to take, along with a handful of other classes that we're in the works of getting set up here, and that should start in the next month or two. So, if that something that you're interested in, you can always reach out to us and we can put you on the kind of wait list for that. Um, Or if you keep an eye out on our social media, we'll definitely get some more information out in the next uh, week or two as we finalize everything. Well, this has been super informative. Thank you so much for all of the great information and for joining me on the podcast, Allison. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. When we were faced with the puppy stage eight years ago and a dog that was raised on a farm by her canine parents, Icelandic ducks and Nigerian dwarf goats, we encountered some reactivities of our own. It was with patience and understanding of the livestock guardian genre of dog 
that we were successful in calming our own little basket case. We're happy to report at nine years old, she's a happy girl who snuggles into her spot on the couch next to me. We also know some dog lovers aren't so lucky to have their puppies grow out of that stage. And in the professional pet photography business, I come across a lot of trainers who believe their training protocol is the right one. In fact, sometimes it seems that anyone who has taught their dog to sit puts up a website and calls themselves a dog trainer. So it thrills me to hear that Allison not only believes in the science of animal behavior and bases her training on that, but she is also an advocate for regulating the industry. It's vital that we not trust just anyone with our dog's behavior. And as Allison says, we need to do our research before selecting a trainer to help our dogs. And as I've learned over the years in my involvement in the dog industry, Dog training is as much about training the humans as it is about training the dog. That can't be an easy task sometimes. Next week, oh my gosh, this next episode, I gathered together some of the photographers from One Last Network for another roundtable. If you haven't listened to episode 7 yet, that was our first roundtable and we talked about the art of end of life photography. This time we're tackling the subject of helping our clients create memories to comfort and heal in the profoundly painful days after they lose their precious babes. See you next week. I'm Angela Schneider, owner of Big White Dog Photography in Spokane, Washington, and your host at One Last Network, signing off to go get some Bella Snuggles. Listen to One Last Network on whichever podcast platform you prefer. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode. If you have a friend who might be interested in our content, make sure you share us with them. Thanks for listening.